Hi, um, this topic is about best practices for virtual trainings using Zoom. And you'll find differences of opinions about it. These are what I think are the best practices. Um, several of us are put our heads together after our virtual training that we did. And we think that these are best practices that we wanted to recommend. So understand, first of all, that when you're going into a virtual training for the first time, you probably want to keep it simple. But you will still use various tools in each virtual training, each lesson. You'll probably be showing a PowerPoint. You may be using Zoom, probably will using Zoom whiteboards, Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, you might want to show a video or an animation from YouTube. Um, you might use Google Drawings, Google Jamboards, Padlets. So you're going to want to open all of those tools before you start. Now, what do I mean by that? Take a look at my screen here and you'll notice that this is my web browser here where it says New Tab. But you notice I have uh, a Google Drive open. I have a Google Jamboard open. I have a Google Drawing open. I also have my PowerPoint open, and I can move into slideshow mode or, or run it not in slideshow mode, either one. But it's important to have each of those open before you start a given lesson. What does that mean? Well, it just means have them started up, ready to run uh, on the page or the screen that you want to show. Why is that important? That way you can move quickly and easily from screen to screen, and you don't have to stop screen sharing uh, go to another screen if you use the screen sharing part of it where you just select screen. There's another video on Zoom screen sharing. I encourage you to watch that one. So start your PowerPoint in advance. Have it ready in slideshow mode if you're not going to be recording answers on the screen as you go. If you are not going to be in slideshow mode, you may want to use PowerPoint itself to capture comments. So you build a blank slide in. So in other words, after this particular slide, could have built in a blank slide that would be a place to type in the answers that people come up with to this question. The way we used it, we had it, a link to the Jamboard in here, so it would be easy to move to the Jamboard. Uh, so start all your Google Drawings, Jamboards, uh, Google Forms, Padlets, PowerPoints, YouTubes, Vimeo, whatever it might be. Uh, if you've not done a virtual training before, let me encourage you, point two, to start a long time in advance because you'll have to take the contents from existing Che lessons move them into a PowerPoint or Google Slides or some other tool. And that's going to take some time to think through how you should use automations or slide transitions to capture and maintain attention. So don't try to capture every point from the Che lesson plan because you won't have the time to do that. You need to keep the pace moving along quickly because people are just sitting staring at a screen without other human interaction and they will get bored and drowsy if you don't keep it moving. So. Now, I capture the, key, the principles, of course, and two to three key takeaways. And I thought one of the comments we had from um, one of our regional coordinators who observed the virtual training was very, very good. He said, make sure that what you do is teach the topic, not the lesson plan. The second thing about, I would say uh, here, is that if it's at all possible, have one of the facilitators or a tech savvy person be available to help attendees work through technical issues while you are presenting your lesson. You don't want to have to stop presenting your lesson to have someone deal with a question that comes up or to readmit somebody to the room if their uh, internet drops, something of that nature. So have another one of the facilitators, a co-facilitator, or a tech-savvy person available to help. Point three, practice, practice, practice. You can start a Zoom meeting with just yourself to explore many of the Zoom capabilities, and you should do that. The, the thing you can't do is you can't create a breakout room by yourself so you need to engage at least one other person if you want to practice using breakout rooms, and I highly recommend that you do that. You want, again, to uh, avoid having to, um, I'm sorry, it's highly recommended that you practice teach at least a couple of lessons with someone else, including all the things you're going to use, like breakout rooms, polls, things of that nature, uh, in advance to get comfortable with screen sharing and switching from one screen to another, moving people into and out of breakout rooms, using the various tools that you selected to use anyway. Point four, have people turn on their cameras and leave them on even when they're in the breakout rooms. Next one, have one person in the breakout room that will screen share any documents or images that the people in that room need to see so they can work on their assignment. I would recommend this, that you identify some people prior to the class, probably a week or so in advance, what we did is we sent out a survey to identify people's technical skills. So we asked people to rank themselves on technical skills. We asked them if they were familiar with certain tools like 
Google Drawings, Google Jamboards, Zoom, etc. And so we identified a couple people that were very tech savvy. And typically those will be some of the younger people in your training. We ask those people in advance to look at Google Jamboards, look at Google Drawings, play with them, look at Padlets, uh, learn how they work. And then we use those people in each breakout room as technical resources again, because the other people may or may not take the time to look at Jamboards, even though we ask everybody to do it in advance. Uh, so it's important to have an, a, a good resource in each breakout room that can help other people. What about role plays? Well, role plays can be done with virtual trainings, but everyone should switch their Zoom view from gallery view to speaker view if you're going to do role plays in Zoom so they can have a larger image of whoever's speaking on their screen at that point in time. And their screen that way will automatically switch to whoever is speaking rather than seeing the gallery view that shows everyone. Everyone that is not in the role play should also have their microphones muted during that role play. Next point, tool selection. Again, there's, there's no more important instruction perhaps than to play with all the tools you're considering using before making final selections. If you want the greatest flexibility in tools for breakout rooms, there are some trade-offs and they're, they're not always easy ones. Google Drawings, for example, is very flexible but only has one page per drawing, meaning that each small group would need to have their own unique Google Drawing to work on. That means each one of those breakout rooms that's going to work on a Google Drawing has to have their own URL and they cannot exceed the space that's on that one Google Drawing. That's the drawback primarily with Google Drawings. Google Jamboards has less flexibility. For example, you can't size the boxes as well. You can't change the fonts, the size of fonts, but it does allow multiple pages per Jamboard. So what does that mean? Say you're going to have three teams and team one is going to work, look at one passage, team two at another passage of scripture, team three at another passage. Uh, you can share one Google Jamboard and with just sharing one Google Jamboard, you can, uh, there's one URL, so you can sh copy that, that address, put it into the chat box in Zoom, and everybody has their URL, and they can go to the page that's for Team 1, Team 2, Team 3. So it's, it's easier to use for breakout sessions, I think. Google Drawings could be very, very good for uh, full group discussions, uh, or if you want to have everybody have their own page, that's fine, but you're going to have to deal with multiple URLs. Let's talk about Padlets for a minute. Uh, we will do a video on Padlets as well. It's, it's quite flexible and feature rich, but there is a free account. The downsize is with the free account, you can only have three Padlets that exist at one time. Each Padlet can be expanded vertically or horizontally and show um, different groups on different parts of the Padlet. They could have assignments on one Padlet and just go to different, scroll to different parts of it to sh do their work. But it can get messy that way. Uh, and in some ways, Jamboards may be the best solution for small groups as they can all work from one URL, but that way they each have their own pages and they can create new pages if they need more. So let's talk a little bit more about best practices. I already mentioned surveying those that are going to be in the class to identify those that have the greatest computer and technical skills. So try to find people that already have experience with breakout rooms in Zoom, um, with Jamboards, with drawings, uh, internet searchability, whiteboards, uh, but if there's no one with the ex specific experience for the tools you plan to use, find the ones that have the greatest re degree of just technical understanding. And again, ask them to be breakout room leaders uh, as they will adapt to the tools and figure out how to use them much more easily if the group gets stuck. Uh, one thing here, a little bit of a caution, we mentioned elsewhere in another video, but be aware that when we were doing our session, we found there were some issues with iPads and Zoom. So we would discourage their use. Also, smartphones are not a great idea just because it's, it, you know, the screens are small. It's hard for people to read information, hard for them to, to participate and make annotations, things of that nature. Uh, let, online tools and breakout rooms. Once you've identified your tech breakout room leaders, encourage them to use the tools and play with them, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Send them a list of the links where they can watch videos to learn the tools and ask practice with those tools. And then spend a little bit of time with each of your technical people that's going to be breakout room leaders. Go through a little bit of training with them on Zoom and with those tools. And only about an hour is all that's necessary. You can do all of them at one time probably. Um, but it is helpful to have 
a co-facilitator or a co-host in Zoom be in command of setting up the breakout room assignments throughout the training? Um, that way they get it down well and they, they can do it. Uh, you might need to have two people do that just because if the one that has been doing it throughout the training is doing a presentation, it's helpful to have somebody else set them up. Quick accessibility. Uh, and we already mentioned this. Have all the things open and running for your lesson uh, in advance. Google Drawings, Padlets, Jamboards, uh, your PowerPoints. Make sure they're ready to go, open, and ready to run. Uh, makes it a lot faster, quicker to get into things, and you don't have to stop screen sharing and go back and forth and back and forth all the time. When you do share a screen in Zoom, click on the Zoom that's the top of the screen that's the top left hand of the options you have to share uh, on your computer. And then again, as a general rule, just alt tab between screens when you want to change from one screen to another, and it'll automatically switch to whatever screen you're looking at on your computer. I think it is command tab on Mac, but I'm not absolutely certain. Uh, scribing, let's talk about scribing, uh, taking the place of the flip chart in a in-person lesson. Um, whoever's facilitating should not also be the one that's trying to scribe. So you want to have a co-host, a co-facilitator that's going to be able to help you scribe. And again, you can scribe on things like Google uh, Drawings, which is what you see here. You can scribe on Google Jamboards. You can scribe on a PowerPoint that is not in presentation mode. Um, but have someone that you've trained in the tools do the scribing for you or somebody that's tech savvy. What about break times? We recommend that you take a five minute break at the end of each lesson and a 15 minute break approximately every two hours. Uh, our experience was that a half hour for lunch was more than adequate, uh, but we'd recommend that people stay online and connected with their computers uh, during the training, during lunchtime, I'm sorry, and just have friendly conversations about whatever comes up in order to help build a little bit more uh, sense of teamness among the group and the trainees. Always be sure to assign co-hosts. Co -hosts. Whenever you start up a Zoom session, assign co-host capability to at least one other person, probably your co-facilitators. Even though you may be using a static Zoom link, I would recommend that you email a link out nightly to each, uh, to the full training team and the people that are going to be in the training. Uh, we did that each night just to be sure, even though we were using my own personal Zoom address, which never changes. But uh, this would be recommended certainly for a training that's going to stretch over several days or which might require multiple sign-ins to Zoom. So make sure and send that out so people don't have trouble the next day getting into the Zoom meeting. Uh, what about last-minute information? We recommend that you email out a document a day or two before the training starts that reminds them of the daily schedule, what times you're going to start, what times you're going to finish, uh, has the link address in it for the Zoom meeting, anything that you might want them to install or learn before coming to training as a reminder, uh, who to contact with questions. We think that was a very uh, good thing to do. That way people have one kind of a last minute reminder that, oh yeah, I'm supposed to go take a look at Google Drawings or at Google Jamboards, whatever it might be. Now here's one that may not always be possible, but I would highly, highly, highly recommend that if you can use a hardwired Ethernet connector between your computer and your router rather than using just the Wi-Fi connection. Your Wi-Fi may be very good, but there can be glitches with Wi-Fi that will cause issues. A hardwired Ethernet connection will eliminate some of that Wi-Fi uh, issue as a possibility and take it out as a variable. So most all routers have a jack for an Ethernet cable to be plugged in. If your computer does not have an adapter that lets you connect to the Ethernet uh, or a built-in plug, if you have a USB port on a Windows computer, you can get a USB to Ethernet adapter that you can use. You can get that at like Best Buy or, or any electronic store pretty much. Uh, you also can get a Lightning to Ethernet adapter for Macs as well. So try Amazon.com if there's no Best Buy near to you, but you can get it one shipped to you if needed from Amazon. Best Buy, like I said, uh, has both kinds of connectors. Or if you have a Mac, if you go to an Apple store, you'd be able to get a Lightning to USB or Lightning to Ethernet connector. And another final thing here, uh, we'll finish and wrap this up. 
Uh, I would recommend that you create a post-training survey that you can send out after the training is completed. Uh, you can use something like Google Forms, uh, although it does seem that respondents, uh, you'll have problems with people that don't have a Google account being able to access it. Uh, another tool you can use for free is SurveyMonkey. Uh, those are both free, fairly easy to use. It helps you do an evaluation of what people found useful in the virtual training, what they found problematic, um, and also for them just to kind of rate the overall training itself so you get some feedback. Th what would they recommend you do different next time? Um, so that's about it, I think, at this point for best practices. Uh, obviously, as we do more of these trainings, we will develop more best practices as time goes by and we will update this video with those when that happens. But thank you and good luck with your training.